Thank you so much for attending our eight uh, conference uh, on the earthquake and aftermath uh, seminars uh, with the Middle East Technical University uh, Faculty of Architecture. Uh, today we have firstly a foreign invitee and this, this talk will be about the Lisbon earthquake the, on the 18th century, uh, 1755. And today we will host uh, dear Rui Tavares, and he's from uh, Portugal, and he's a historian, he's an author, he has degrees in art history, also history, and he has, I think, PhD in, let me uh, say, PhD in history, sorry, uh, from uh, Paris as well. And today he will talk about the uh, Great Earthquake of Lisbon. And we would really like to thank him for uh, his acceptance of our invitation. And uh, I would like to give floor to him without making you wait as long. And then we will have some maybe time to answer questions and comments from the audience. Thank you so much, Diri, for accepting our invitation. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Professor Duyu Shihangar Ribeiro and Professor Gujin Shin uh, for our um, talk here today, for the invitation. Uh, we were checking out the slides before we started and we noticed that the, the first 10 or 15 slides, they are readable, but they do not have the resolution that I, uh, that I see on, on my site, that I see it's, uh, that I thought it was enough. The last uh, five uh, slides that I had imported from another presentation, they are in good shape. But anyway, I think that the, the idea of bringing some images was today more just to set the scene. Uh, it's not because our uh, um, conversation here today will be on either art history or architectural history. We'll touch on, on, on those issues. But the, the main question about the Lisbon earthquake is the history of ideas. There have been more destructive earthquakes and there have been earthquakes on other important uh, uh, cities. Uh, and there have been earthquakes also in important periods of history. But the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755, at least from the uh, perspective of, of, the, uh, of the Enlightenment, is a very important event. It, uh, in, in a book that I published a few years ago, I compared it at the time with 9-11 because it was the event that we all had in our mind as, a, as the kind of event that changes the world. Uh, I imagine that you know, in many countries around the world, the titles that were on the front pages of, of newspapers uh, on the 12th of September 2001 were similar to the ones that I saw here in Portugal, the day that changed the world. Uh, there are not that many days that change the world, although philosophically every day changes the world a little bit. But the earthquake of uh, the 1st of November 1755 in Lisbon is one such day. It was also compared, uh, I also compared it to the great fire of Rome in 64. Uh, uh, of the common era as being a referral point in assertions about the philosophy of history. Does the shape of history change? Is history a straight line or is it a crooked line? Uh, this is a debate that was uh, important after the uh, Lisbon, the Great Lisbon earthquake. So what I mean is that catastrophes are never only significant by and in of themselves. Catastrophes are significant as social, political, and philosophical events. They depend a lot on the context, on the interpretation of the contemporaries of, the contemporaries of these catastrophes. And uh, even more importantly, they depend on the interpretation of the generation that comes after the catastrophe. That's why I decided to call this presentation. Let me see where it is. Wait, wait, wait. 
Uh huh. Okay. Give me a second. Okay, I hope it's working. So I decided to call this presentation The Earthquakes Children. Uh, and I think that in the end, you, you will, um, we will make sense of why is the generation that comes after the catastrophe so important. Uh, the subtitle is Lisbon's Great Earthquake of 1755 and the Birth of Modernity. So let's start with the facts. Uh, Lisbon is a city on the westernmost tip of, uh, uh, of Europe. Uh, it is a city by an estuary of a big river called the River Tagus, uh, which you know uh, uh, secludes the harbor from the sea, uh, making it a, a very important natural and safe port. Uh, of waters that run deep enough for big boats uh, and that uh, have been the basis of uh, explorations into the Atlantic Ocean and beyond, which made Lisbon a very rich city uh, in the 18th century. Uh, of course, the uh, Portuguese explorations of the Atlantic and then the passage to the Indian Ocean uh, the fight for supremacy uh, in the Eastern trade, all this happened in the uh, in the very end of the 15th century, but mostly the 16th century. In the 17th century, Portugal had been uh, in a dual monarchy with Spain, which meant that the capital for 60 years was not Lisbon, but it was either Madrid or Valladolid in Spain. At a certain point, the kings of both Spain and Portugal um, which was the same physical person, but juridically two different kings, uh, or rather uh, it was a dynasty of three kings, but what I'm saying is that each of them was juridically king of Spain and king of Portugal at the same time. Uh, at the point they thought about changing the capital to Lisbon, but this would uh, maybe create imbalances in the rule of the whole Iberian Peninsula that was unified at the time. In 1640, there was a revolt in Lisbon of uh, the Portuguese aristocracy. And Portugal, again, has a national dynasty. People sometimes speak of this as a restoration of independence. It is none of the sort because Portugal had, had always been an independent kingdom. But it is indeed the restoration of a national dynasty in Portugal. In the 18th century, Gold and diamonds were discovered in Brazil, uh, which was a, a, a dominion of the Portuguese king. And again, Lisbon was very rich because it received those diamonds and gold from Brazil. And the taxes that were collected uh, from them. So uh, this is in a very Catholic kingdom that has a functioning inquisition. Uh, um, uh, prosecuting uh, Protestants, mostly prosecuting uh, new Christians, i.e. Uh, people of Jewish descent that could sometimes be um, suspect of Judea Judaizing, meaning that they were now officially Christians, but sometimes they would keep some of their habits, traditions, and beliefs at home. And uh, the, the harbor was one of the most important uh, in Europe and certainly the most important in the in the uh, in the in the western facade of Europe uh, the one facing the Atlantic maybe with the with the competition of Amsterdam on one side and Seville on the other but uh, still uh, certainly the most important one in the Atlantic facade so here, I don't know if you see the pointer. Uh, we can. 
Okay, good. So here you have the river, and here you have one of the main squares of the city, to which we will come back. It's called Terreiro do Passo, which means that it is the grounds of the palace. The palace of the king was here by the side. Now it's called Praça do Comércio, which means the commerce square. But people, you know, even after 200, more than 250 years, they still call it by the old name, the name that it had in the first half of the 18th century. And then what you see here, this, you know, superposition of uh, um, squares and lines is an attempt by a military engineer after the earthquake of making a kind of a double map where you have the streets of the old city that had been mostly destroyed by the earthquake. They were narrow medieval streets that came from the hill that was before uh, you know, the, the, the Arab Lisbon, before the 12th century, and before that, the Roman Lisbon. And the blocks that you see here are the plans for the new city. So I have here a different image that was done for my book contemporarily, where you have in gray the city as it now is. It is a typical Enlightenment city, one of the very first and most uh, perfect examples of, a, of an Enlightenment city with orthogonal streets. It was, uh, these blocks were built in a, in a modular way where uh, windows and doors and the frames of buildings were built outside, outside of the city. They were brought to the to the construction grounds and then they were uh, they were erected in in situ and in the black lines we still have the map of the old city so it was a very uh, complete change between earthquake and the new city this is the area that was destroyed by the earthquake uh, the earthquake there were still no uh, accurate measurements at the time. Uh, so the Richter and Mercalli scales, they come after the earthquake of Lisbon 1755, which was also an important earthquake, one of the most important ones for uh, 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 geophysics and seismic science. And sometimes people will say that the degree that uh, the... Um, uh, the intensity degree of the earthquake was nine in a Richter scale. It may have been a little bit below that. It was certainly one of the strongest ones uh, in Europe, but the scale was done afterwards and it was done in reference to, to Lisbon. But the, the uh, main problem with the Lisbon catastrophe with the with the, with the earthquake is that it was not only one catastrophe, it was actually three catastrophes in the same day. We had a, an earthquake, and then we had a tsunami, that it was somehow abated by the fact that Lisbon is in the, in the, uh, in the mouth of the river, not directly facing the ocean. So the, the waves were about 12 meters outside on the ocean, like uh, 12 kilometers from Lisbon, but inside the mouth of the river, they diminished by half, and they were only six, only uh, three, uh, six meters uh, high. But then the biggest problem was that since the 1st of November is an important Catholic holiday, it is the day of all saints, and everybody was in the morning of that day in the churches, which were uh, uh, lighted by candles and, and candelabers. Uh, these candles and candelabers, they fell and they produced fires. So the fire started in the churches and they spread. So this is the former center of Lisbon, from the king's palaces to the main civic square, to the castle here, everything destroyed by the earthquake. Very quickly, uh, leaflets, opuscules, many kinds of books, uh, some very sens sensationalistic and, you know, alarmistic, uh, the others more factual, started being um, distributed and sold in Europe. 
and depicting the destruction of Lisbon like this. So you have the earthquake, you have the fires, and you have the revolted waves in the foreground of uh, the waves of the tsunami. And here you have the square that I mentioned. We'll go back to it. Also, images showing the refugee camps after the earthquake. So here in the background, you have the city still uh, uh, reeling from the earthquake with fire still abreast. And on the foreground, you have people trying to live in tents. Even the king had to live in a tent uh, for years after the earthquake. Also because he was traumatized by the fact that his palace had been destroyed. He was lucky. He was not he and the royal family because the the the, the autumn of that year was um, unusually warm. They were not in the center of Lisbon. They were in Belém, in a, in, a, in a town outside Lisbon that now belongs to Lisbon, but uh, in the 18th century, it was a different municipality. And so they were not on this palace that we see here that was destroyed by the earthquake. There were also, you know, romantic images of the earthquake, uh, mainly of the tsunami. And before we, we proceed, let me just say that these are hundreds of images uh, by, you know, many different authors in many different countries uh, that made the earthquake of Lisbon a global phenomenon. So it was not only a natural phenomenon, and for the inhabitants of Lisbon, both Portuguese and foreigners, because of course there were many foreigners in Lisbon, a human event, but it was also a kind of a media event that was uh, broadcast by an infrastructure of correspondence, mail, booklets, uh, gazettes, and so on and so forth. Uh, so many of the of these books referred to the uh, wealth of Lisbon before the earthquake that had been destroyed in a single day. Uh, maybe the most impressive example of that was the, uh, the one of the Lisbon Opera. Uh, Lisbon had just inaugurated an opera house. It was by the river, by the Tagus. It's, it's uh, called today by historians Opera do Tejo, that means the Tagus Opera, the, the opera of the river Tagus. Uh, but it has been completely destroyed and mostly, you know, disappeared from the collective memory of the city. It only resisted uh, for, uh, for um, six months, I believe. So it was inaugurated in May, I think in the 1st of May. So we are today in the 2nd of May. So it's, uh, uh, we are practically in an anniversary of the inauguration of the of the Opera House in the 1st of May, 1755. And then in the 1st of November of the same year, the Opera House was no more. Here we see it's destroyed. The Opera House was so rich that uh, many of its first visitors in the first representations in the Opera House said that it was too rich for people to be able to witness the shows. Okay, let me see here. Okay. Uh, and then it was destroyed. This is a model for the reconstruction of Lisbon. Uh, the reconstruction was not exactly like this, but you see that the city uh, being rebuilt is now a modern geometrical orthogonal city typical of the Enlightenment. This is the square to which we will focus now. This is before the earthquake, during royal celebrations. Here you see the palace that was destroyed. And here we see in the same square an auto de fe, uh, meaning an execution of the Inquisition. So the Inquisition was, of course, a religious tribunal that was both commanded by the crown 
and by uh, the church. It had a mandate from Rome, from the Pope, to uh, be established in Portugal since 1535. So uh, in that period, it was already 220 years old. And it had white, white powers, including the ones of the death penalty, which they usually did by burning. So it is quite um, interesting, quite symptomatic that the last person that was killed by the Portuguese Inquisition, by the Lisbon Inquisition, was actually a priest, a Jesuit priest, that was very, very devout, very religious, and that ended up being caught in the debate after the earthquake, to which we will now pass. So. Now we we'll leave behind the history of the actual destruction uh, of the Lisbon city, and we will uh, turn to two examples of the debates of ideas uh, proceeding from uh, the earthquake. One is uh, less well known by people who are not interested in Portuguese history. It's the case of this book, which is called uh, judgment of the true cause of the earthquake that was inflicted upon the city of Lisbon in the 1st of November 1755 by the priest Gabriel Malagrida of the Company of Jesus and an apostolic missionary. Uh, this was published in the beginning of the next year, 1756, so the earthquake was, was in November. In the very first months of 1756, Gabriele Malagrida, this Italian Jesuit priest, published a book on what he called the true cause of the earthquake. Malagrida was a, a priest that had been uh, in Portuguese territory for many years. He knew Lisbon well, but mostly he had been in Brazil for almost 30 years. And he had recently came back to, uh, to the capital of the empire, to Lisbon, where he was in very good standing uh, among the royal family. So he was a preacher there. And after the earthquake occurred, he preached what usually uh, religious people, at least in Christian lands, were used to preach, be they... Uh, Protestant or Catholic or maybe even Orthodox, which is that a disruptive natural event like an earthquake had surely one cause and one cause only. And this cause was the sins, the irreligion, the heathen and impious aspects of the lives of the uh, of the Lisbons or Lisboners of the Lisbon inhabitants. Surely, if Lisboners had had to suffer with an earthquake, it was because they had misbehaved, since earthquakes are the typical natural shock that must be sent by God. This was not unusual. This was actually part of the first wave of reactions to the earthquake in Portugal, outside of Portugal, among Catholic priests, among Protestant priests, uh, John Wesley, the famous founder of Methodism in England, he also wrote about this, and they could disagree about everything, about the mass, about, uh, you know, whether you should have images of saints in churches, in terms of theology, liturgy, everything around the Christian faith, they would disagree, but they were in agreement on one thing. An earthquake was a message from God. This was, of course, a political problem for the king and for his um, minister, uh, a man by the name Carvalho e Melo, uh, Sebastião José de Carvalho e Melo, who became the Count of Oeiras, and then he became the Marquis of Pombal, so he is most well known by the name Pombal, which is a name that it is a title that he would only have in the future. But for simplicity's sake, I will use uh, Pombal as his uh, name. So Pombal was uh, the prime minister of the king. He had been an ambassador before. 
uh, in London and in Vienna. He had been a diplomat in Vienna. With he was not a full rank ambassador, but he had been the chief of mission in Vienna. He had come back to Portugal to be the minister of foreign affairs, and he was the youngest of the ministers in government in the day of the earthquake. Uh, the others were not victims of the earthquake, but they were already in frail health. They were old. So he ended up being the strong man of the king's reaction to the earthquake. And to him, this idea that the earthquake had been the fault of the inhabitants of Lisbon themselves was a big political problem. Because if you assume that the earthquake was a moral event, that it was an event sent by God to punish the people of Lisbon, then, of course, the people of Lisbon must have been bad Christians, bad Catholics, bad believers, irreligious and impious people. This, of course, had not been a problem in the months and years beforehand, and this is uh, something that is it's worth mentioning among a Turkish audience, because uh, of course, there's uh, there have been many earthquakes in Turkey, and in recent times there was still in memory an earthquake uh, in Istanbul or Constantinople, which the Gazette of Lisbon, the newspaper of the city, had of course considered a punishment of God to the disbelievers in the Ottoman Empire. So when the earthquake happened to the others, it was very easy to explain as a punishment by God. They were impious, they were disbelievers, they were not Christians, and that's why God had decided to punish the city of the Sultan. But when it happens to us, then it becomes much more difficult, because if you accept that the people of Lisbon had to be punished, that's because they had a bad king. Because if they were irreligious people, it was because somehow the king had let it happen. So when Malagrida says in his book that the causes of the earthquake of Lisbon are not the stars, they are not exhalations, it's not the air, it's not gases under the, um, under the ground, it's not any kind of natural cause but rather it's only our intolerable sins, as he says, literally, then for the king and, the, and his chief minister, this is a political problem. And they will put pressure among the Inquisition. So here it is a rendition of the, of the Jesuit priest preaching after the earthquake. They will put pressure on the Inquisition to trial and to execute the Jesuit priest. While at the same time, they will withdraw the censorship powers from the Inquisition. They will create a new caste of political censors of the state, a new tribunal called the Royal Censorship Board, which has the authority to read all books and produce judgment on the books. And while the priest, the author of the book, will be trialed, condemned, and then burned by the Inquisition, the book will be read, examined, and prohibited by the state's censors. And the conclusion will be the same, that he had been arrogant because he had believed that he could ascertain uh, the true cause of the earthquake, which was the title of the book. Of course, it was a title for effect. It was not an unusual title in the books of that era. And that uh, he had indirectly blamed the subjects of the Portuguese king and the Portuguese king himself, King Joseph I, of being bad Catholics. That's why he had to be burned. So here, the chief minister of the king, mostly out of a political preoccupation with the stability of the kingdom itself, ends up producing a shift in the way that officially nature is seen by the Portuguese crown. 
it this shift goes from nature being seen as a kind of a of a transmission belt by God that sends messages to the uh, to the humans that live in nature to being more of an uh, amoral element. The censors write at a certain point of Malagrida's book that the causes of the earthquake, quite on the contrary from us being able to know what the true causes are, we do not know. But they are certainly not moral causes. It was not God because the people of Lisbon they were not bad Catholics, and even the priest himself, when he had tried to exemplify what were the sins of the people of Lisbon who were attending mass in church in that day, he could only come up with the fact that sometimes young people will send, you know, uh, uh, written notes from boys to girls during mass in the churches meaning that they you know, wanted to, to, to flirt and that this was the most intolerable sin that the priest had found, meaning that God had just destroyed the capital of a kingdom and the capital of an empire, a very wealthy city, killing thousands of people in the process just because you know, young people were sending written notes to one another during the mass in church. Okay, let's now pass to the second example of the history of ideas post-earthquake. That it's much more well-known than the one of Malagrida. And this is the book by Voltaire called Candide ou l'Optimisme, who also binds our two countries because uh, an important part of the book, of course, it's uh, set in, uh, in Lisbon, but then it ends in uh, Turkey. So uh, Voltaire was then the most famous and most rich author in Europe. He was living in either France or Switzerland, uh, alternately. Uh, when he was in trouble with the king of France, he would move to his uh, farm in Switzerland. And when he got in trouble with the Calvinists of Geneva, mostly because of theater, because Voltaire was... Uh, 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 dramaturgist, and he he liked to have theater representation in his castle. Then the Genevan Calvinist uh, uh, pastors they would they would fulminate against him because uh, theater was forbidden in Geneva. This, by the way, was the reason of the falling out of Voltaire and Rousseau in the 18th century, because Rousseau, of course, he came from Geneva in Switzerland, and he thought that the Calvinist law forbidding theater was a correct one because theater was falsehood and it was, uh, you know, a bad education for people. Voltaire, on the contrary, thought that theater provided a good moral education for people, so he was in favor of theater. When he received the news of the Lisbon earthquake, that was two or three weeks after the fact, he wrote to his friends saying that he fell into a deep depression out of empathy to the people of Lisbon that had so much suffered. The first thing that he did was write a poem about Lisbon. It's a tragic poem called Poème sur la tragédie de Lisbon, a poem on the tragedy of Lisbon. And in this poem, he, first, if he, he attacked for the first time the theological explanation of the earthquake. He thought that it was impossible that the people of Lisbon had to suffer when the people of Paris or London who were much more sinful than the Portuguese inhabitants or the, um, the Portuguese or foreign inhabitants of Lisbon, they didn't have to suffer through an earthquake. Voltaire could not believe that God would punish Lisbon and spare Paris and London. At a certain point in his book, in his poem, he writes, Lisbon is crying, Paris is singing and London is dancing, and yet Lisbon is the city punished with an earthquake. But his foray into the debate on the earthquake, uh, although it was very widely read, it was not convincing at first. 
many authors wrote back to Voltaire insisting that God had to have something to do with the reason of with the reasons of the earthquake anyway. So Voltaire, a few years later, in 1759, which is also the year in which Malagrida was burned by the Inquisition, he went back to the subject by producing not a tragic poem, but a satire. So he wrote Candide ou l'optimism, Candide or the optimism, that he falsely claimed uh, to be a book translated from the German by someone called Monsieur le Dr. Ralph, that we see here in the title of the book. But then it says par M de V. Everybody knew that it was Monsieur de Voltaire. Uh, everybody knew that style, that writing, and everybody knew that almost only him would be as brave uh, as he was to write about, uh, you know, the religious and political authorities of Europe at the time, of Christian Europe at the time. So. Uh, I will proceed with a few images about Candide. These are images by a, a Portuguese contemporary um, artist called Vera Tavares. She, uh, she's also called Tavares as me, but no, not my cousin. But she's the illustrator to my books here in Portugal. So she she produced, you know, a couple of illustrations to my translation of the you know, of the Candide by Voltaire, and I think that they are, you know, uh, not only precious but they also help us explain. What is the point of Candide? The point of Candide is to explain a shift in the history of, uh, uh, of the Enlightenment consciousness that we usually call modernity, that we associate with philosophers like Kant. The idea that we come of age and that we, we as humanity, as a collective, uh, that we realize our agency and our personal sovereignty to do our choices by ourselves. And that we do that by deciding to, uh, not, not, uh, to not live any longer under the tutelage of either kings, priests, or whomever, or, or feudal lords. This is the way that Kant explains that transition into modernity, where humanity itself is, a, is an organized political community that has sovereignty and agency. Voltaire explains it in a different way. It's this coming of age is not as much something that we as humans want to have, but is something that is forced upon us. He explains that by the character of Candide, who is a young boy who lives in a castle in Westphalia. He is found out, he lives very happily under tutelage, under the tutelage of a baron in Germany. Uh, he thinks that this world is paradise, but one day he is caught with the daughter of the baron and he is expelled from the castle. As you know, Adam and Eve were cast out of paradise. He's expelled from the, from the castle, and from then on, he has to live his adult life. So the entry into modernity is, long, is, not, is not like in Immanuel Kant, a kind of an organized, orderly act of the will. It's more of an expulsion from paradise. It is something that we have to be forced to... Uh, to, to engage upon. So he goes around the world and around the world he sees massacres and witnesses the end of kingdoms. Here he's on a, a, a meeting over a table in a, a, in a kind of a, a, how do you say, estalage uh, or auberge. Uh, well, a restaurant by the road. He is meeting several former kings and former princes, former sovereigns of Europe um, that have been, you know, that have fallen from their thrones. And with this, Voltaire is trying to say that we have now entered a phase in history where uh, 
a big political change is coming, but this big political change is mostly arbitrary. That it is only us that after the fact are going to attribute meaning to what happened. Things happen out of the blue, uh, sometimes out of random events like an earthquake. For Voltaire, of course, the earthquake could not be a moral event. As I said, the, the inhabitants of Lisbon, they were not sinful enough to be punished by God. So the event had to be a natural one, and it had to be completely amoral. It was not part of a plan of God for ourselves. In fact, as he was trying to explain in the Candide, God has no plan for human beings. We are on our own, and we have to make do with the, what we find. The first part of his argument, of course, is in agreement with what the minister of the king in Portugal had said. The earthquake is not a moral event. But the second part of the argument, that that means that God does not have a plan for us and that we are on our own, is of course something that the king of Portugal and the minister could not be in agreement. So the same censors of the king that had prohibited the book by Malagrida also prohibited the book by Voltaire, meaning that the religious interpretation of the earthquake was unacceptable, but also that the, you know, completely irreligious uh, interpretation of the earthquake was also unacceptable. And this is the, what you see here in front of, of you is the part of a censorship uh, report by the censor saying that authors like Locke, Bell, Pope, Voltaire, and Leibniz had to be prohibited, which is, of course, ironic. We can go back to that since Candide or the optimism was a big attack, a big attack on also Leibniz. Leibniz, let's interrupt here the, the, the slides and go back to you. Where are you? Ah, here you are. Uh, the... The, 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 I was saying that Candide was a big attack from Voltaire uh, against uh, Leibniz. We can talk about that in the questions. And now that we have uh, seen a little bit about the earthquake of Lisbon as a physical event, and that then we passed on to the debate of ideas between a religious interpretation of the earthquake and a completely naturalistic interpretation of the earthquake, let me just end up by explaining. Why did I choose to give the earthquake's children as a title to this presentation? I think that when a big event like an earthquake or a pandemic or a big terrorist attack happens, or you know something like the fires of Rome, people will say that this event has changed the world and that it must change the opinions of people. Something of such a magnitude that you have to change your ideas about either the world or politics or nature or philosophy. But actually, what we see when these events occur is that people become even more crystallized in the opinions that they already had. For instance, if you, you know, look at the debate between nationalism and cosmopolitanism in the world today, people who are nationalistic before the pandemic, they were even more nationalistic after the pandemic. They thought that we had to close borders and that you know the pandemic was a good excuse, a good pre pretext to do what they already wanted to do. People who were of, of, of a more cosmopolitan bent, they ended up being even more cosmopolitan afterwards. You know, saying that uh, you know the, the COVID virus does not respect borders that we have to give more power to the World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, when you have an event that changes the world, it does not as much change the opinions of the people that are contemporary to the event. They already have their intellectual rivalries. They already have their adversaries, their enemies. They already have their reputations to protect. So people will become even more entrenched in their positions. 
But that does not mean that the event does not change the world. I do think that it does change the world if it, if it is an event of a big magnitude. The event sets things in motion. It provokes reactions, and these reactions will have other reactions. If the chief minister of the king in Portugal had not decided to take the political position that the event could not be a punishment by God, then he would not have, you know, unintentionally helped the argument of something like of someone like Voltaire, who was saying that, you know, these events do not have any kind of theological character at all. And then the generation that really becomes important is not the generation of people who are already adults when the event happens. It's the people that are born or on more or less the time of the event. Let me just very quickly mention some names of people that were born in 1755 or around 1755. You have Robespierre in France. You have Alexander Hamilton in the Caribbean who will emigrate to the uh, British colonies in North America and will become one of the fathers of the independence of the United States. You have just one day after the earthquake, Marie Antoinette, who is born in Vienna, in Austria, and then becomes the, king, the queen of France, and she will be beheaded by the French Revolution, meaning that it is the daughters and sons of the earthquake, the children of the earthquake, that will make the revolutions in America and in France. And then ushering uh, you know, big chunks of uh, uh, Europe in the 19th century into modern you know, uh, uh, liberalism. What is happening there? Is this a coincidence or not? I believe it is not a coincidence. Because if, if your fathers stopped believing that earthquakes were provoked by God, then the sons and daughters, a generation afterwards, will also think that maybe God does not send kings and queens to the thrones of Europe and that they can be replaced by republics. So I think that there is indeed a link between the Lisbon earthquake and the revolutions in France and the United States because these revolutions were done by the people that had been the sons and daughters of the earthquake. They replaced the old contract between subject, God, and king, in which if an event like, a, like an earthquake happens, you have to redouble your, uh, uh, your obedience to the king and your devotion to God. And they replaced it with the modern contract of people, state, and nation. And maybe that is something that may also be happening as we speak with the children of the pandemic. Or you will tell me with the children of the earthquake that you had recently in Turkey. Meaning that these people will already be born in the new world. And maybe in this new world, we need a different type of contract. One that is no longer between subject, king, and God, but also not as much as between nation, state, and people, as it was in the 19th and the 20th century, but a contract between humanity, nature, and technology. But that, of course, is a question for a different talk. Well, thank you very much.